was definitely one of the illest lyricists I ever heard. That's real. All right, man. He's coming out. Guns blazing, baby. Juggalos and Juggalettes, it's your big homie, Big Ian, coming at you from Harlem, New York, with the legendary R.A. the Rugged Man. So, um, I've been wanting to make this interview happen for a long for a long time, so I want to thank you for the opportunity to do this, R.A. The first thing I want to talk to you about is your upcoming album, Legends Never Die. Okay. One of the things that um, a lot of people know about you as an artist is that you're very particular on who you work with and, you know, sort of collaborate with and bring into your world. And part of the reason I wanted to reach out for this interview is because you recently announced a collaboration with Tech 9 who's an artist that uh, we do a lot of coverage on and are very big fans of. And so we, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you was, what made you reach out to Tech 9 for, to collaborate on this album? Well, what, what happened with Tech 9 was, I know Tech for about eight years. And he, he's a good friend, and uh, Richie Abbott, who's his publicist, and he, he, he reps me. Uh, he's a and R with Strange Music. He, he's a big, uh, one of the big guys at Strange Music. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, years ago, I was working on a movie, too. And we, I was, Tech Nine was supposed to be in the goddamn movie, and he said he'd do it. He, 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 we interviewed him for it and everything. But then at the last minute, he got creeped out. He said, you know, I can't do this movie. There's, you know, there's girls with pussies and this. It's just too crazy. I'm not doing it. I said, but I thought you was doing it. So at the last minute, Tech pulled out. So I, so I called up Vinnie Paz and Reef the Lost Cause. I said, look, yo, yo please show up because Tech pulled out. We wanted crazy Tech. I think his hair was all spiked and crazy at the time. So it was the good luck for the part. Mm -hmm. But he pulled out. So he called me and he said, yo, oh man, anything you need musically, I'd love to make music with you. I'm a fan of yours, man, but just the movie shit is too crazy. So when I was working on my album, I was doing things and then, and then I said, you know what, I could rap any style. I said, I don't want to pigeonhole myself. People are used to me rapping with Wu-Tang, Mob Deep, you know, New York Street. Yeah, things. the East Coast. And it's all, that's the dope shit. But, you know, I said, you know what? Tech is phenomenal, and if you go to Tech stage shows, he could roast almost anybody at his live show. Nobody could fuck with Tech with a live show. His shows, you know, he's, he's a monster on stage. So uh, I said, you know, I gave him that call. I said, hey, hey let's do that music. So, uh, you know, we, we rocked on his beat, and I went crazy. Like, I'm doing a double time kind of bizarre, sick flow that nobody ever heard me do for that particular record. You know, like, like, uh, I got on my album, I got a lot of the boom bap shit, you know, the, the vintage rugged uh, hip hop, the shit that the hip hop fans, like them, you know, 90s era hip hop cats want, and 80s era hip hop cats want, but I also, you know, flipped it up and did some wild out shit that motherfuckers gonna be like, yo, R.A. can even do that? <laughs> you know, like, like I, I wanna show people I could do anything. I could do any style, man. It's part of my trade is I could, you know, hit the pen, I could, I'm versatile, man. Okay, and, and so, well, what year did this happen with the movie where Tech had to pull out? The more he pulled out of the movie in uh, uh, the, we shot between Thanksgiving and Christmas in '06. Movie dropped in '08, I think. '09, '08. But uh, we were filming this the winter of '06. Okay. I mean, after winter, you know, yeah, 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 Christmas '06. Okay, and there, and so it was sort of in the spirit of wanting to get outside your own box to on this record as far as. Collaborate what, what, what you can do. Uh, you know what it was in the spirit of? It's the spirit of tech is a dope MC mm -hmm. that does dope shit technically. He's technically the shit he does. So I wanted to let motherfuckers know I could hang on that level, that kind of shit. It wasn't like out the box, like let me do something different. It was like, yo, I'm a technician too. I want to compete with all levels of hip hop. I don't want to just, okay, street shit. I want to go like, yo. This dude Tech is technically a monster the way he flips his flows and words and I want to show cats the way I can flip my flows and words. So I, I just want to fuck with the best rappers, you know, in, in every lane, you know, no matter no matter if it's West Coast, East Coast, Kansas City, I just want to fuck with all lanes and, and, and you know, be incredible at my craft, you know? Okay, and, and on the same subject of collaborations, there was also, um, you had announced that you were also going to be working with uh, Hobson on, on this uh, Legends Never Die album, correct? Yeah. What, tell us the story about how the two of you came to work together. Well, Dame, you know Dame from Funk Volume, he runs Funk Volume with uh, Hobson, and uh, Hobson, uh, I, I heard a couple people post on my wall and say, yo, when are you and Hobson fucking? I was like, who the fuck's this Hobson guy? I don't know who he is yet. I didn't really know who he was yet. You know, a couple years back, Dan hit me up and said, look, I want to fuck with all the cats we respect in the underground and put together this 
like kind of coalition where we all kind of get together and you know like if Hop is tweeting about something or you're Facebooking this and we all have like all of us stick together as an underground kind of revolution like we're all doing it ourselves and it was it sounded like a great idea so I said you know what I'm, I'm I'm with it brother let's do it so then I started looking up Hops and his joints and I seen that pans in the kitchen shit he did before he went indie when he was yeah. with EZ's label and I said, yo, this shit is crazy. And it reminded me of myself, because he was talking about, like, banging the fat bitches, special ed classes. I'm like, yo, that's crustified. <laughs> like, like, this brother's been through some of the shit I've been through, it looked like. So I was fucking with the pans in the kitchen shit. And then, um, and then so Dame, uh, after Hop started getting the, you know, the 20 million views on these videos, like, you know, started doing all good, Dame said, Yo, you know, when I approached everybody to do that, you know, the stick together program with all the rappers, he's like, out of all the old school cats, you're the only cat that was like receptive, that like respected it and like took it serious, you know? So, you know, it was almost like, you know, we had a lot of love for each other, me and the crew. So, so, so me and Hobson fucked around and did a joint that's, uh, we're gonna finish it up and, and throw that on Legends Never Die. And they also have an artist called Jaron Benton, who's a new artist at Funk Volume Sign. It's a dope rapper. And um, uh, we just did a joint for Jaron's project. So, you know, there's a couple funk volume things in this thing in the works, you know. But Jaron, I've seen some people, oh, Jaron ain't no real rap, he's a gimmick, he's shock value. You know, people always diss. They always want to diss. They diss me, diss Hop, diss Tech. They, they, don't matter who the fuck, you can be cozy, right? It don't matter who you are, they're going to diss you. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, you get more love than hate. Yeah, it's just the hate. I've seen some cats go, oh, Jaron's just, you know, he ain't worthy of funk vibe, blah, blah, blah. And I said... I was laughing because then I did a little research on Jaron because I like Jaron's rhyme style when he rhymes straight hip hop shit. And that dude was down with Eddie F, who was Heavy D's producer. He was down with Eric Sermon, who was one of the greatest producers in hip hop from EPMD. Like he was fucking with the big dogs before he even went to Funk Volume. So a lot of cats don't know the history behind Jaron Duncan. You know, he's a really legitimate rapper. You know, and he's dope. And the record we did together, we both went in hard. And, and I took it back. Cause he is on that wild, disgusting style. Mm -hmm. I took it back to when I was real, you know, cause I was doing that hardcore shit in 91. Yeah. Like I was like 92. Like I was doing it before probably 99% of the human beings ever knew it even existed. Before your first jive deal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got my jive deal off of songs like Rubber Room and Bloody Axe and all of that shit. You know, so yeah, I was way before jive. But jive, jive uh, you know, I was on that, you know, look, horror movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, you know. It Exhibit a, a. It was a part of my uh, culture, the horror movie. So, but so on the Jaron Benton record, I go really deep into some real foul, horrible, you know, you know, busting off and flooding the apartment with cum. We <laughs> went really nasty on that one, you know? Okay, and is that uh, the collaboration y'all did? Is that something that's going to be on one of his future Jaren's projects? That's project. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Also on the album, is, uh, you know, I got Brother Ali and Master Ace, a song with those two together. It's like, you know, the new school, you know, uh, hip hop cat that's just, you know, lyrical or Brother Ali type in the old school Juice Crew legendary Master Ace on the record. I got my old raucous buddy, Talib Kweli, and that particular song, we go, we don't, it's not even a song, we just rap. It's just like, he went like 30, you know what happened with the Talib Kweli record is, I sent him a rough of what the subject matter was going to be that I, the song was about. I said, you know, I just sent him like 30, 40 bars of me rapping. So, you know, there's the subject matter. So you could write to the beat and here's what I'll be rapping about. Mm -hmm. I, I said, I'll condense it and turn it into like a regular verse, when, you know, but this is just so you can get started. And apparently he didn't read the fucking message I wrote him because then he just fucking sent me a verse back that was like 32 bars. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it, I'm going to just keep it like this. So we kept it both 30, 32, 38, but like it's just us rapping like motherfuckers about historical issues throughout the world. So that's a great record too, man. And a lot of good records on it. Vinnie Paz, of course, me and Vinnie Paz got one that's, that's uh, just brutal, man. So a lot of great, great records on it. And Sadat X is doing the hook on the Vinnie Paz book. So it's, it's a great, I'm very, very proud of my new work. And I think, you know, being, in the game so long, I'm putting out some of the best work in my career, and I'm very excited about that. You know? Okay, and now something that I, uh, this is a question that I ask a lot of artists that this is relevant to. I, I asked this question, Tech Nine recently, uh, Mad Child of the Swollen Members, and I would like to get your opinion on it. 
which was, um, there, there have always been kind of uh, two semi-distinct undergrounds, which is where you had like kind of the lyrical backpacker underground, and then you had sort of the, the like the wicked or horrorcore underground that, that, you know, both have been, been around for so long. And for many, many, many years, it seems like there was always sort of a division between the two. A lot of the artists seemed like they didn't want to work with one another. There was not a lot of collaboration or acknowledgement of the other. And in the, in the last 12 months or so, there have been a lot of uh, crossovers beginning to happen. Uh, you know, uh, particularly you working with Tech 9 working with Hobson, both of them have very strong ties to the Wicked Underground. Um, and, and, uh, and a lot of others as well. Swollen members recently collaborated with the Insane Clown Posse. And so I kind of wanted to get your take on uh, your, your view of the two undergrounds and uh, why you think they may not have worked together as much in the past and why they are now. I'm not sure why they didn't work together. I didn't even know. I wasn't even aware of the two underground. You know, I just listen to music, so I'm not a little ignorant. I just say, if, if somebody has music that I think is dope, like, like uh, Tech is a dope MC, period. I fuck with him. Jaren is a dope MC, period. I fuck with him. And, and it's also a conflict between underground and mainstream. You know, oh, we fuck the mainstream MC. But like, you know, there's a couple MCs that are dope mainstream MCs that if they reached out, well, hell yeah, that's a dope mainstream MC. Like, like if a ludicrous type was like, yo, all right, I'm, yo, that dude got voice, flavor, delivery. It don't gotta be, it don't gotta be like, Jedi mind tricks can only work with Ari the Rugged Man. And Ari the Rugged Man can only work with Apathy and self title you know, it doesn't have to be that. It could be like, motherfuckers can make music, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, uh, I like making dope music, man. Like, I, I, you know, there's a kid named Eamon who, who, who was a monster singer. He had a hit record in, in 04 that sold like 10 million records worldwide. It was called Fuck, Fuck, Fuck You, Ho, I Don't Want You Back. It was big, it's in a Guinness book for most curse words in the history of a number one hit record. You know, okay. so, so, uh, and he's a singer. And, and I just wrote, uh, co-wrote five songs for his his singing album that he got coming out. You know, that's gonna throw people for you know what I mean? And he got live band, live instrument, and you know, uh, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a soulful pop record. And I co-wrote five records on that thing, so I, I love music, you know what I mean? Okay, and uh, so uh, extrapolating on that again. Uh, extrapolating, what, what's that word mean? Uh, b building on, expanding from. Is it extrapolating? <laughs> It sounds like something like lesbians would do with strapping date with each other. That does sound hot. <laughs> so, like, um, sort of on the subject of discussing, like, you know, the different different styles of underground music and stuff. Um, on your a very popular song of yours is a star a star is born off of Die Rugged Man Die. Yeah. And in that, uh, you know, one of the artists we cover pretty extensively over Fago Lovers is the Insane Clown Posse. And um, one of the things, again, I know that you have a lot of Juggalo fans, and one of the things that always seems to come up when Juggalos are talking about R.A. the Rugged Man is what was the context and your, what did you mean when you slid them into that song? Because the, the lyric itself was somewhat benign. But then what's, the, what's benign mean? Uh, non-threatening. Oh. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, like non-threatening, not not intentionally like going at somebody. But then the music video kind of had that uh, the scene where it cuts to the record executive okay. kind of taking a little bit more of a dig at them. Okay, well I'll tell you the, something that people don't know about that is it wasn't a swipe at them. It was a comedy. It was like a Saturday Night Live skit. And people don't know this. I got a friend named Sam the Sleazebag that's a juggalo, and he does all the prop work for my videos, and he helps me on all my stuff. And and when I told him I was shooting the video, he, we, he said, yo, you know, I know some of the people that know Insane Clown Posse. You know, you need we need to get them to do the, do the part when they show up in the label. So they he reached out to Insane Clown Posse themselves to play that part that I'm supposedly dissing them. Really? In. So, but, you know, and he said, yo, we could take a ride out to Detroit and shoot it if they're with it, but supposedly they weren't receptive or, or, or the labeling the back, whatever. I, I don't sure. know them, I don't know who they are. I don't know them personally, I don't know the relationship with anything kind of possible. But if I'm supposedly dissing them, then why the fuck we was trying to get them to play the part in the video? Okay. You know what I mean? So, so do you have like a, like your st like a standalone opinion of their music or them, uh, you know, their contribution of musical culture as a whole or you anything? You know, I know there's a juggalo site so they hate me, but I'm not really up on their stuff so much. Like I really, I'm not really educated on a lot of the Insane Clown Posse uh, musical history. So I don't have, I, you know, I know that's a disappointment to you, but what I do know is when I signed a job, they signed a job after I left Jive, 
and my producer Mark Niles, who produced the song with me and Biggie, and a lot of my classic Crustified Jib stuff, he started working with them and they did a song for the movie Great White Hype together. Even before Insane Clown Posse really had a following. So I knew my man, a good friend of mine, was working with them back in what, 95, 94, 96? When did they go on their on Jive? Oh, uh, they signed a Jive in 95? Yes, in 95, then. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they, 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 I heard that song that they did for the um, Great White Hype movie and uh, a couple other records here and there that, 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 uh, that I remember, but I'm not really up on their music, man. Okay. You know, so. Yeah. All right, well, shifting focus back to the Legends Never Die project, have you gotten to a point uh, in recording where you have a, a speculated release date? Yeah, well, we were planning on, on um, um, releasing this October, but we wanted a better setup. We got to put out the first single, and they want to get a national tour for me for January, so... Um, we're gonna probably most most definitely have it out first quarter, um, probably third week in January or second week in January, and have the first single out ASAP, like within the next three weeks, and promote the next single and, and get the tour going around with the album release, you know. So, because uh, if we would have dropped it this October with no tour set up and no no first single, no setup, uh, you know, and then and then the Christmas season coming, you got to compete with all the pop records and yeah. stuff. It would have been a tough market for for a little indie indie guy like me. No. Okay. Where are you at in recording? Is this project done, being mixed and man, mastered? I got 25 songs now, man. So I don't know what the fuck to do. So the thing is, the label want to do 15 and, uh, you know, uh, hold some of the records for, like, you know, for promo and this and that and put out an EP or something. But uh, I think I'll probably put, like, 17, 18 on there, split the difference. Because also, if you do put on 25 songs or 23 songs, it is a f overflow of not okay. We get you already, you know. Like, like, you know. Uh, but each song is my little baby, so it's like it's not like I got songs that I feel like a whack, you know. When you like, I take the whack one off, so it's hard for me. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's hard for me to decide which one you don't use. Like this one tells that story. This one does that flow. This one has this artist. This one has that and this. And it's a tough job for me. But the only song that's not finished yet, because we pushed the release back, day back, is. Uh, you know, I was in the studio, I tweeted the shit about it, uh, you know, I went crazy because it's my idol. I was in the studio with Rock Kim and we did a song for a movie soundtrack. And the song is is great for what it is, but it's got it's uh Rammstein, you know Rammstein? Oh yeah. They're playing the guitar on it, it's like Rammstein, Rock Kim and me rapping and Chantel, the big pop artist that sang uh, Impossible. You know, she got like 60 million views on her wow. videos, like she's like a big pop soul singer. So it's like this big it's for a movie soundtrack. So I think when people hear Rock Him and R.A., they, they, they'll like that record because we're both killing it lyrically, but it's not the street record that some might want. So if I get Rock Him on a record, uh, I said, you know what, I would love to do a street record with Rod too. You know what I mean? So since I got a, the date back, pushed back, I said, let me do a record with Rock Him for this album. So I'm writing a rhyme to a, to a Mr. Green Bee right now. And I'm gonna send it over to Rock and see if I can make the Rock Kim already rugged man song for the album too. You know? Okay, all right. Um, something else that I wanted to talk about was uh, you had mentioned uh, that you kind of in, in a in a recent interview that you've got a new book in the works, um, or that there was somebody you were working with to kind of do like a, a co-written autobiography. Correct? Has there been any news or developments on that? Uh, yeah, the dude's working on it as we speak, and. Uh, you know, he, he, they approached me to do this project and, and, you know, I just talked, they, they, tell, they asked me questions, I talked, just kind of like what we're doing, and he writes them, and he wants it to be my autobiography, but I think it should be a biography, but he knows more, more about it than me, you know what I mean, so, he knows more about the selling of a book than me, so, you know, uh, he wants me to rewrite my words and all this stuff, but it's going to take some time if he wants me to do it because then you have to sit down and, you know, step my pen game up and put in some work. So if it's on me, uh, it's going to be a while till that fucking thing drops. But if he could write it, you know, he'd be out quick. I gotcha. Okay, so there, there's no real big developments on where this project's at? Yeah. Okay, um... Another thing was, uh, again, in a recent interview, you mentioned that you were also working on a, a new script for a movie, um, and that, you know, you just, it was just one of the, you didn't really elaborate on it a lot, you just kind of threw it out there, it was one of the things you were working on. Have there been any developments about the script, where you're at with it, what you plan to do with it? Which particular script was it that I was talking about? Um, uh, 
the interview was a couple months old, and it, uh, you didn't give a name. You just said, uh, you know, uh, current projects. Well, I've been working is, for, on a for new quite, quite a few years. I've been working on a documentary on, on my father. Uh, but then when I was filming it, he passed away. So, you know, it was hard to look at the footage. You know, I got crazy footage. I got his head in his casket. It's just like hard to look at the footage. So, uh, you know, kind of put him on hold. And then I just got an intern, a girl named Molly, uh, that my, my homegirl Lindsay hooked me up with that transcribed all the, that, you know, all the, all the interviews. And so we're back on track, and I got a friend in Hollywood. Um, but my, my ex-girlfriend actually is a, is a successful filmmaker that works with like Jack Nicholson and Roger Corman and, and, and Scorsese's in her movie. Like she, she did good things. So she said, you know, uh, if you bring the footage over out here, you know, I could put it up on the board and, and maybe help you out with it. So, you know, uh, maybe that story will be told a little sooner than later. The main thing for me right now is the music, though, man. That's the thing. It's good because I'm trying to make the best album I could possibly make. So, um, you know, it is, you know, I gotcha. Okay. Um, another thing, and this is uh, sort of out the random information, but I think that to you know a, a juggalo audience might appreciate this. Um, there was an interview I saw with you recently where you were talking about some of the jobs you had, uh, you know, since you were a kid, moving up to being, you know, an artist who does that full time. And one of the ones you uh, were talking about that you did the most was you actually worked at a carnival when you were younger. And I was curious to know, you know, just a little bit more the the full story on that because, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of juggalos. Those juggalos are con they love carnival shit, right? It, it, one of our things, many things. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was a straight up carny my whole childhood, man. Like I was born and raised in that, uh, you know. Uh, big fat guy named Mr. Bill, Bill Billy Clark, and uh, it was the Silver Dollar Circus, uh, that was the name of it, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, my, my father knew Mr. Bill, and Mr. Bill's brother was Red, and, and, and Joey, and the whole family, and uh, the Capasso family, they all, you know, they were carnies, so by the time I was about eight years old, you know, I used to go help set up the rides, and you know, put the fences and when I was around 10 I was the, I was a little ass kid maybe 11 little kid I was the guy you know doing the, hey come play my game come yeah play my game. oh okay so, so it was kind of already emceeing like yo all you gotta do is you know, <laughs> I wish I had footage of that shit well, wait, wait, which kid. games did you operate I, I operated quite a few the, the one where you throw the dots into the balloons but then the main one that they had me doing was the um the stupid ass one when you get the stick and it's fishing, you got the little loop on it, yeah. there's a beer bottle on the floor and you gotta pick up the, you know, if you can stand the beer bottle up, you know what I mean? Like like it's a loop yeah. on a rope, like this, mm -hmm. and you go put on the beer bottle and you, if you could stand the beer bottle up, you know, you win the toy. But uh, uh, the shit, you know, the boards were actually like this. It, you know, so when you look down, you can't see. You know, so, you know, just like how the, the the basketball hoops are fucking like that, you know, the, the, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like all a scam, the whole carnival is a scam. And it's catered to make you not win prizes. Yeah. If you, in fact, what they were doing with, with, with us back then in the, in the 80s, they said if, if you lose a stuffed animal, if someone wins a stuffed animal for you, it comes out of your money. Even though it was only costing like two or three dollars for the toy, probably we, we would look like if we lose one of the big guys, we'd have to take twenty-five dollars out of our pay that night. It was crazy shit. So you did everything you could possibly do to make sure that the dude wouldn't win a prize. Damn. Like on on the rope, there was like a little red piece of tape and and the little instructions. Like so, if your hand is over that tape, you know you're cheating. Mm -hmm. but nobody's reading that fucking. It's a little piece of shit tape. So what happened, if anybody did get it, usually their hand would be over the, the little fucking tape. Yeah. So you go, oh, no, sir, sir, your hand's over the tape. Didn't you know? count. So then they'd have to do it again, and nobody's going to get it twice because the fucking boards is yeah. like that. In fact, it was funny, when I was about 12, 13, I was working there, and a future four-time heavyweight champion titleist, his name is Jamil McCline, not titleist, you know, he fought for the title four times, Jamil McCline. He fought Vladimir Klitschko, Chris Bird, Nikolai v Valiev. Um, um, Sam P. He fought for the title four times. He went to my high school. He was a big, big, big black dude that was, you know, running guns. He was a, he was a troublemaker, and uh, you know, he cleaned up his life and became an athlete. He came and played the game when I was 12. He was like 16. Had had a little white girl on his arm, and he won it. And I was like, Yo, man, you, you know, you, you you over the line, man. You know. And he's like, No, nah, fuck that shit. I won that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Now, he, didn't, he actually didn't have an accent though. He's like, he's like, fuck that shit. I won that shit. Pulled the stuffed animal and walked. I said, yo, man, yo. What, what, what <laughs> I do? That's, that's the 
you know, the nice with his hands and the gun run. I was, like, you got that. I was a little kid. <laughs> and so you were you were twelve when you originally got hired there, like twelve. No, I was working eight eight years old. I said. Yeah. So like eight, eight through. Four, four, four. I was doing. I stopped working at about fourteen. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you was in a lot of your videos and interviews and stuff, you uh, you talk about your family a lot. You talk about your father, your stepmom, lots of your brothers and sisters. One of the things that I very rarely hear you talk about, or I haven't ever really heard you talk about in a lot of this stuff, is your mother. So I kind of wanted to just kind of ask, what's the story behind your your mother and why you don't mention her in a lot of your videos? And that's that's I, I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry. You know, uh, I, I didn't mean that to be the case. But the reason I talk about the other side of my family more than my mother's side is because. I wrote the Uncommon Ballad song. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the hip hop fans want to know about, you know, Sergeant Thorburn. And, it's a, and, and he, you know, he had the more brutal life. He had the horrible, you know, a lot of horrible shit happened to him. My mother, on the flip side, is an amazing, uh, beautiful woman. And I talk about a lot when I'm in Germany because she's a German. Okay. <laughs> when I'm in Germany, I don't talk about my father as much as my mother, you know. So I guess it's, it's just, you know what it is? She, 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 Moved out of here, moved to America when she was 18, and found a crazy soldier boy, my father. And I don't even know how the fuck they ever even met each other. I don't even know how the fuck they could even did the most opposite people in human in, in history. And my mother, my father was a little crazy at the time, and was you know putting her through some things. And she raised two two kids, me and my sister, uh, while my father was you know getting in trouble. And uh, she's a great woman, great woman. And she's alive and she's doing great. And, and uh, she, she started doing makeup for Lancome Cosmetics. And when I was a kid, my mother was very broke. And you know, she had like friends bringing, you know, giving her food for, uh, you know, she was a broke woman. Cause she's, you know, young, you know, European woman coming to the States and raising two kids single in America. Yeah. So it was tough for her, you know, trying to work at the diner, doing model gigs. And uh, cause she's a beautiful woman. And uh, then she started working for Lancome, and uh, she started doing okay for herself, and started doing good. And then all of a sudden, when I was about 14, she bought me a, a, a big, clumpy video, she bought me a nice video camera. Like, holy shit, like she started buying me shit, because she was doing good at work. So I was like a little ass kid, 14, with a movie camera, you know, with the big VHS tape you gotta put in the fucking thing. And yeah. Play. She was a great, she's, she is a, she's a great, great mother and a great woman. But but then um, she they said, if you move to North Carolina, um, we'll give you a big job raise to work in North Carolina. So I think they <clears throat> increased her money 10 grand a year if she moved to North Carolina, plus the cheap and the living's, the living's cheaper down there. <clears throat> so when I went to visit my mother, uh, she had a nice house. And I was like, wow, mom came up in the world. So she did. She did nice for herself for some time, you know. And but the poor thing is, is then the companies they make you work longer. She's a, like a 66 year old woman still, you know, working her ass off every day, 50, 60 hours a week. And she's a hard working, good woman, great man. I, I was one of the few people in the rap game, not in the rap in the world, who was just blessed with two great great parents man. you know e even if you know my father was a little crazy and didn't have the money and my mother you know came up in the struggle they were just you know, a lot of love in my family you know, from both sides you know, so. okay and uh you mentioned and i i read that somewhere i believe it was on your wikipedia page that you know your uh, your mother's heritage was she was from germany out of curiosity because it wasn't listed there what's your father's, your father's heritage sicilian and scottish Oh, okay. Yeah, awesome. All that my father's uh, father was a Scotsman, and he was a writer. And he wrote for for the um, Stars and Stripes for uh, in World War Two. He was a, a American soldier that was a writer. Instead of instead of lots of weapons, he had a typewriter on his back and cut like a little handgun. And uh, and uh, my my uh, grandmother was a, a beautiful. You know, frisky, crazy, wild uh, Sicilian lady, and she ended up marrying the, the Scottish soldier, and and uh, the Sicilian stopped talking to my grandmother because you know back then you you know you ain't no Sicilian woman marry a Scottish man. You know what the fuck is going on here? So she got cut out of the family. Wow, yeah, yeah. it's a different time. You yeah, know? like white people couldn't even marry white people. <laughs> 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 Okay, um, and, and another thing that's gotten real popular in hip hop again in the last couple years is like collaborative projects where you know we've had Ill Bill and Vinnie Paz, we've had Necro and Cool G Raps, uh, uh, 
Slain from La Copa Nostra and uh, Mad Child from Soul Members. I've heard her doing one. Is, is there? Have you? Has had that ever been uh, a thought that crossed your mind to do a collaborative effort album with someone you like know, that? Like there's so many records that almost happened, you know. But uh, you know, I live my own life. I guess I, I got my own schedule and I do what I do. And you know, there was originally gonna be a project with me and Vinny Paz before he did the El Bill one. It was gonna be me and Paz right after on Common Valley. We were talking about doing an album, and then. Uh, you know, he sent me over beats, we started writing, but then there was an issue with me and Baby Grand, and a bunch of things took place, so it kind of just, you know, fell apart. Then we had a, talked about a collaborative project, me and Prince Paul started working on one while I was working on this album, and we had another MC in that group that, you know, remains nameless, but, you know, he's my brother, but um, that thing fell apart. So, you know, Mr. Green, that hit me up about maybe doing a collaborative, you know, uh, project, and I'm, I'm in love with that guy's music right now, his beats, I just love everything he does, man, like, I really love the work he did on my album, but, uh, you know, yeah, of course it's gonna come in your mind, you know what I mean? Like, I would love to do, like, I would love to do a, a somebody who would do a cool I, I don't know who I would like to do it right now, but I'm just focused on my, my solo project right now. Okay. But a collaborative project's easy because all you gotta do is rap. So if there's like 11 songs on the album, you just gotta drop like 11 verses. That's like three songs. Yeah. You know, you do a whole album yourself, you're doing three verses on, you know. So a collaborative album, that's why I think people do them too because you're, you're getting the other person's fan base plus doing half the work. Less than half the work because, you know, usually in the mouth, you're only doing one verse on each song, or maybe a verse and a half. Yeah, I guess half. Do you think that that makes some of these collaborative projects uh, not as n not not of the high quality that some of the solo work could be? It depends who the artist is. Some people, you know, love you know put love and craft into everything they do and make sure everything's great. But some projects people do do throw away shit. Like, yeah, fuck it, we'll hop in the studio, do this album in a week, and whatever, whatever, and throw it out there, you know, that those projects do happen too, so it depends which project that is, you know? Okay, did you ever, uh, did you and Vinny Paz have a name for the project you guys were supposed to be doing together? He had, a, he had a few names that I wasn't really, uh, really into, it's like Drugstore Cowboys, like me and they have to cut History of Violence, and stuff like that, and I kind of said, yeah, but this kind of named after two popular movies, like I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't really, you know, so, so you know, me and Paz always, he's my, my brother. Paz is one of the good guys in the game, one of my brothers, so, uh, but I, I, we didn't we didn't get to the point where we had a name for it, you know? I gotcha. I didn't want to sit drugstore cowboys, I, I didn't like, you know, I don't do drugs even, you know? I mean, sure. So. And no tattoos either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, all right, all right, like I said, I, that's all the questions I got for today. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say to everybody listening? Yeah, man, uh, uh, just check out the new music, man, and I, I'm not going to disappoint any of you. And if any of you fuckers come to my live shows, you know, I could, I could throw a show better than just about anybody. So just uh, appreciate all the fans for all the years and, and uh, keep, keep paying attention to what I'm doing, you know? Okay. Ari, thank you very much for taking the time to do this interview. Juggalos, this has been Ari the Rugged Man and Big Ian. We're out. Hey, yo, this the whole story. The whole truth is retarded. Here's how my whole bullshit career started. Back in 88, it was about battle rapping and shooting guns off and house party. Say, oh, 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 oh. Rhyming. No complaining, uh -huh. no money, no fame, we still maintain 1991, now my whole career started buzzing. You seen the stage shows? He gets the crowd jumping. And the kids tell me, boy, Mercury, priority wanted me. Russell Simmons.